That was um, Bach's Goldberg Variations, of course. His fourth variation from the Goldberg, yes. That, that was the first record you ever made, wasn't it? Almost. It was the first American recording I ever made. I had made a few in Canada just before that time, but uh, I guess that's what counts, that it was the first American recording. Paid the rent for a few months. Paid the rent. Why do you, uh, why do you like recording so much? You're really a recording pianist, aren't you? Totally a recording pianist, I'm happy to say now. Yes. You mean you never now give a concert ever? Uh, my last concert, uh, as of the date at which we record this conversation, was two years ago. Well, when we, um, later on, perhaps we'll have time to find out why. But first of all, why so much love for recordings? Because it's the future. It's the future for music, it's the future for performing music, it's the future for writing music. It's the future for listening to music. All of our futures in music are involved with recording. It's as simple as that. And as complicated as that. They're enormously big assumptions. I mean, do you mean that... I'm quite prepared to prove them here and now, Humphrey. The concert hall, as, you, as we know it, is... It's dead. It's dead. Well, the Festival Hall's doing quite good business in London. The New York Philharmonic Hall is doing quite good business. Well, I don't know whether you're a gambling man, but don't put your money on it, that it will still be doing good business in the year 1999. You mean the people won't want to go and listen to a Tchaikovsky concert even, or...? I'll be very disappointed in the audience that I think is growing up now if they do want to go and listen to a Tchaikovsky concert. I say this with nothing against Tchaikovsky. I say it only with the idea of Tchaikovsky concerts would, to me, be an absurdity in, um, in 1999. You'll have to develop this straight away. Well, I think that we're in a moment of transition in, um, in music right now, and I think that this moment of transition doesn't just simply concern styles of music, styles of the way in which music is written. I think it concerns the way in which music is being listened to. I think that, in fact, we have to consider the listener precisely as what he is, as the ultimate end of all our objectives in making music. I think that the listener, for the first time, at least the first time since the Renaissance, or the earliest days of the Renaissance, perhaps, has suddenly realized this, has suddenly realized that he indeed can throw his weight around, the very great power that is being given to him. To find and this power. Indeed. Well, I'll let, let me come to it. I, I think that um, it's unlikely, once one grasps a certain power, a certain power that is attainable through a certain kind of role, that um, one can expect this listener to give up that power. I think it's the power of um, making decisions that are, in fact, incorporated into the performance and ultimately into the composition of music. I think it's as important as that. But I, I think the listener today, sitting at home behind his massive stereophonic dials, which are very primitive dials, when you compare them with what he's going to have 10 years from now, even, uh, if he can afford them, uh, sitting at home behind those massive dial boards uh, is making decisions that at any earlier time in history, at any other moment, would have been counted interpretive decisions. He's deciding on balances. He's deciding on the things that conductors decide upon. They say, you horns, tighten up on that. You're playing that. You're slackening there. You behave, you know. He's making those decisions in effect. He is, in fact, uh, allowing his decisions about A channel and B channel to be interpretive. He's making conductorial decisions. He is deciding about the the clarity that he wants the sound to have, whether he wants it to have bass rumble or high tweeter or whatever it is. Um, again, these are sounds that a performer would make as to his choice of instrument. I mean, he is in fact supplanting or supplementing the choice that I as a performer would make when I choose an instrument and say that's a good instrument for playing Richard Strauss or a good instrument for playing Bach. Wouldn't like to be one instrument to be good for both of those things, but you know what I mean. The, the listener is in fact helping me make that decision because he's saying when I listen to a Bach recording, I'm going to turn that switch with a lot of treble and very little bass in order to get something of the, the clarity that the baroque music ought to have. When I listen to a Richard Strauss recording, I'm going to take that treble, I'm going to turn it back, and I'm going to turn up the bass in order to get this enormous width and spread of sound that it ought to have. And you may very well say to me, is a listener qualified to do this? Because this, of course, is, I'm sure, your next question. <laughs> and uh, I hold that not only is he qualified, or can he become so qualified with uh, the erudition that's available everywhere today in, in recorded catalogs, and simply through listening experience, but that indeed he must become so. This is his role, this is his future. But you can't explain to me, as it seems to me, how the listener takes on the, the, the conductor's role, the, the, the question of determining tempo, the question of, of determining... Well, have you never seen a, tr a turntable that was acceleratable, you know, with one of these sliding things that, in fact, gives you uh, any range between 33 and 78? It's entirely possible to... to um, 
uh, what's that um, rock and roll group, the Chipmunks or something? It's entirely possible to make all Beethoven symphonies sound as if rendered by the Chipmunks, you know. Yes, but this is really... One octave high. No, I'm, it would, naturally I'm carrying it at absurdum, but I'm saying it can be done. Any gradation between a chosen speed of record companies is entirely possible. But now, I want to hear Klemperer's Beethoven. I don't want to do my own Beethoven. Why not? Are you afraid of your own Beethoven? Well, I think Klemperer's got a more experience for a start. Better but mind. if your own Beethoven were more satisfying to you, why would you not want to indulge it? Well, I can't see why it would ever be more satisfying than taking the range of recordings from Fürth Wangler and from well, all the Well, now, forgetting about your own Beethoven for the moment, and I don't see why we shouldn't come back to that later on, but uh, forgetting about that just for the, uh, for the moment, would it not intrigue you to incorporate Klemperer's Beethoven, if I may coin a heresy on this for the moment, with Bruno Walter's Beethoven? Wouldn't intrigue me at all. With George Zell's Beethoven, with Leonard Bernstein's Beethoven. No, I'd like to keep them as separate experiences. I don't see the virtue of making them composite. Well, the separate experience is only valid if you take the position that the ascendancy of the interpreter as a sort of split-off breed from the composer is not only absolutely valid, but irrefutable. And I don't think this is so. Um, I think that, that what happened in the 18th century when performers stopped being composers was the great disaster for music. Uh, and I think that uh, to look at it today as an irrevocable move and to say that this is not any longer correctable, that we cannot in fact get back to that glorious time when performers had a composer's insight into music and when an audience was cons consisted largely of people who performed and composed for themselves, that we cannot get back to that, I think, is simply to say that music is finished. There are many people around who will tell you that music in our purely Occidental sense is indeed finished. Uh, I don't share that gloom, I must say, but um, yeah. there's good cause for it. So how, if the compo if, if the, given even that the listener has an interpretive role to play, yes. though I personally shudder to think of people twiddling their knobs and bringing up the But bass. they do anyway, Humphrey, whether you shudder or no, they are twiddling their knobs right now, probably, as they, as they watch us, okay. the testing volume and so on. Well, given that possibility, I don't see how a listener will ever have a creative role in the making of music. Well, I think that you'll have to assume that by exposure, by experience, <coughs> to the interpreting of music, they sooner or later get a hankering to, to push on a bit and to assemble things, to put together component parts. You see, this question of, of making of music, of creating it, um, has changed a great deal in the last few years because it is now uh, n no longer fashionable. And I, I don't suggest to you that we must hold with what is fashionable only or go along with what is not. Uh, but it, it's no, certainly no longer fashionable to, um, to think of a composer as someone who looks at the sky on a particularly clear night and gets an inspiration and jots it down. It is now rather more in to think of a composer who sits about in a laboratory listening to sine waves and asking several technicians whether, if accelerated and increased along a certain line, this would make an effect that would be cognizant with his purpose, well, providing kind of they know what this is. In other words, it's a corporate decision. So I think it's entirely realizable to include the listener within the ultimate framework of this corporate decision to in fact provide the listener with a sort of skeleton performance which he could assemble together and i i mean on many levels uh, i as a as a pianist could easily provide a listener with 12 different interpretations of the same beethoven sonata uh, and with a footnote saying whichever you like best you may use or alternately you may use all 12 and you may make one that you like supremely well cut it together from the different yes, types quite, quite so. you, there, is there, there is a home editing machine that has just been put out i understand quite recently and, and makes all these decisions interpretively uh, quite possible to the listener but this seems to me again now a kind of dereliction of the role of the interpreter are you saying that you've got 12 different valid views about Beethoven's Hammerklavier Sonata? Oh, at least, certainly. Not perhaps on any given day. I, I think that as a performer, as someone who must get up and do at a certain moment, I fire myself to a, a peak of conviction about one style, about one style of, of making this work go. But uh, that's all it is. It's simply a, a professional duty. It's, it's, it's not an ultimate conviction. I may very well see it the uh, inside way out to the next morning. Well, very tentatively, could I ask you to give me uh just one or two variants on, let's take a Beethoven sonata. Surely. What Beethoven sonata would you like to take? You name it. Well, I've heard your record of the um, uh, C minor sonata. Yes. Opus 10. Yes. That's, that's All right. give me different well, ways not? of playing that. Why not? Well, the record, as you know, is, um, is taken at a rather hectic tempo, something, something along these lines. I don't believe you ought to prove what that is. Well, well, I, I told you already, I don't think it's very good. Cambridge, I know. Thank you.
already quite a lot. Yes. Now, give me two or three other variables. All right, I could with enormous conviction right now, and I say this uh, a year and a bit after having made a recording more or less at that tempo, play it this way. have great Beethovenian persuasion about it. Well, I like it much better. Well, I'm very glad <laughs> it makes you happy. But, uh, and any, um, any combination of the two, in, in, uh, or rather, any, any uh, in possibility in between is, is uh, I'm completely open to it. And, uh, and you're suggesting that your record company might well issue a record which said, here are 12 different versions of the Beethoven. Well, it, it sounds an Orwellian thing to say, but I think it, it is entirely possible, and I wouldn't be at all surprised to see it happen, but I'm not here to make that kind of prognostication, that's very dangerous, and someone may well uh, play this tape that we're recording just now, 30 years from now, and say, what absolute nonsense, things didn't work out quite that way, they worked out differently, but they will work out as arbitrarily as that, because this arbitrariness, this, this question of the performer relinquishing some part of his responsibility has got to happen, it is happening now, and there is no reason to assume that this course of, of change will not be accelerated in the near future. And it will be accelerated in directly the proportion that the audience becomes erudite about the experience of interpreting music. And once having done that, they will not stop with that kind of assimilation. They will go right on into, into composing. But they'll only so. compose kind of electronic music. I can't see how any... Uh, well, certainly, but um, I, I happen to believe, without any dogmatism, because as you know, I'm sufficiently undogmatic to admire all sorts of odd composers who aren't very fashionable today, Richard Strauss and so on. But I happen to believe without any dogmatism at all that, that electronic music is the future. Music. You think it's the only future? Just about, yes. Just about. Well, now let's turn around to why you, you think the concert hall is dying, apart from the positive virtues mm -hmm. of the mechanical mm -hmm. methods of transmitting music. Um, well, I don't think you can just dismiss the positive no. virtues quite that lightly, Humphrey. Um, we might think of some of those positive virtues. It is not, in my judgment, possible to find in any concert hall today no matter how well engineered that hall may be, and very few built today are well engineered, as you very well know, it is not possible to hear a performance of a Beethoven symphony as splendidly executed as you can hear it on a recording. And you can take that uh, phrase, splendidly executed, to mean anything you want. First of all, it's not possible to hear it as well played. It cannot be done. Because at some point, no matter how energized that performance may be, no matter what special festive occasion may have given rise to it, the horn is going to miss a note, uh, there's going to be a string tutti that's not quite together. And this may have nothing to do with a lack of rehearsal time, although it may well have to do with just that. But it isn't possible to, um, to uh, look for that kind of perfectionism in, in performance that, that you will find on any decent recording that you buy. That's, that's the first thing. Secondly, it's not possible, no matter where you sit in that hall, whether you sit in the loges or in the orchestra or in the gods, it's not possible to hear that performance with the kind of clarity and the dissection of the instrumental involvement that you can hear it in your home speaker. Um, the the rec recording process has left the concert hall as means of reproduction of music so far behind now that there's no question of its catching up. Yes, but the concert uh, hall is at least a fairly pure dissemination of the sound. It's natural. It's not uh, been doctored in the way that uh, one can't help doctoring the sound if one uses microphones. Well, what's wrong with doctoring it? Well, doctoring usually means curing, making I mean, are, are, you, are you seriously suggesting to me that if you sit in row A in the Royal Festival Hall, you are hearing the same performance that is heard from row L? No, but you are hearing a performance, which is a true live performance at that moment, not an amalgamation. Surely, but since you're hearing play. a different performance, are you not, in fact, doctoring it yourself by switching seats in intermission with a friend, let us say? I'm not doctoring it, because it's still the same performance that's going on. Well, I, I can't tell you that it's not a natural occasion. I mean, you're very devoted to the spirit of concert giving, and I know you go to a lot of such events. Um, and if you find it a natural sound, there's no reason that you shouldn't go on enjoying it as long as it's still economically feasible to provide concerts for you to go to. I don't think that would be very long. But um, I, I see nothing unnatural about recorded sound. What is unnatural about putting a microphone relatively close to a piano, as we have done here, in order to get a particularly acute balance of the sound of the, of the timbre? Um, perhaps to make it sound less reverberant than it might well in, in uh, an auditorium that seated two or three thousand people in a vast space to, to accommodate. After all, a great deal of music that, um, that I as a performer would play if I in fact gave concerts 
which thank God I no longer do, uh, would be music not written for an auditorium seating two or three thousand people. It would be the music of Bach, it would be the music of Mozart, it would be the music of Beethoven, uh, written for palaces, written for churches, uh, written for homes. Uh, and why on earth should I try to play this in an auditorium that seats two or three thousand people? And if so, is it not uh, likely that I will accommodate some part of my interpreter's purpose to the fact that it does seat two or three thousand people? It is, becomes, in fact, a perversion of you the music in order to do this. You have to over-dramatize it. Indeed, and I can give you an extremely good example of that, Humphrey, because um, in 1957, I went to Europe for the first time and played a number of concerts in the Soviet Union and one of the pieces that I played on every second concert, more or less, and on those concerts in which I didn't play it, I used it, or part of it, as a non-core, was the Fifth Partita of Bach, which is a piece I happen to love very much. And that very same year, I recorded it for the first and only time, and um, I happened to make that recording one week after coming back from the Soviet tour, and I think if I could buy up every extant copy of that recording and call them all in and reissue it afresh, without jeopardizing my royalties, I would do so very willingly. It's a dreadful recording. And the reason for it isn't that um, uh, it was bad as piano playing or anything of that kind. Uh, probably it was more pianistically contrived than any of the other Bach recordings I'd ever done, but for that very reason it's bad. It's not Bach, it's piano playing. Can you demonstrate this? Please? Yes. Um, I played it rather as though one were to look at the score and say, well now, how am I going to project this to that guy up there, you know, 60 feet away in the third balcony sort of thing? Well, obviously, one way you're going to project it is the way pianists traditionally have projected Bach in concert. Lots of crescendos, lots of diminuendos, minor fluctuations of tempo that Bach never thought of, didn't want, and that were no part of Bach's language or understanding of music. So let me give you but one example, I, the Allemande from this partita. Way, as I recall, I played it back in 1957 on recording, if you could believe it. Do like a dose of smelling salts now or later? Oh, are those smelling salts? Yes, I, I mean, it's, it's, it's disgraceful, you know. One has to be revived after hearing Bach played like that. On the other hand... Play it how you think it should be. How I think it should be. Well, it's, it's obvious. about which one can have doubts, because what I sacrificed in version number one, in the recorded version, was the spine of the music. The whole backbone was gone. And it was gone precisely because I knew perfectly well, as a traveling pro, so to speak, that if, in fact, I kept that backbone, it would sound a little tedious in a concert hall, because that great, vast thing that needs to be absorbed out there mm -hmm. um, was going to ruin... It wasn't going to project the clarity that, that, uh, that I wanted people to live off, you know. It seems to me that your criticism against concert halls is, for you, uh, is true, probably, for what, uh, for what you play, but doesn't seem to me to be universally valid for music which was designed for concert halls. For well, I think, you I, might, I think you might properly make an argument for um, a music that was specifically written for a concert hall. I think there might always be a festival occasion about going to Bayreuth. I've never been there. But I can well imagine that Wagner buffs, if there are such, a couple of hundred years from now, may still make pilgrimages to Bayreuth. I think you may find, indeed, that um, the Royal Festival Hall, to name but one, has become a kind of museum, and that you go there to watch a nice, stuffed Strauss tone poem. No, I go there to listen to Richard Wagner Bennett's latest symphony, or to hear some Stravinsky, or Berlioz, or whatever. I'm, I, you do now, indeed. But I mean, uh, let's say 20, 30 years from now, I'm, I'm sure that you will go there uh, as uh, a thinking member of the laity, uh, you will go there uh, to view museum pieces. Yes, but I happen to enjoy going to concerts. I like being but tell part me, of a, but, but, but a yes, group of people. I like the excitement it, of a concert, the atmosphere. I, I think, think this is frightening. I think better. it's a terrible admission about yourself that you do. Uh, this feeling of, of wanting to get with the herd instinct, you know? That's not the herd instinct. I just think that it's, it's, it's fun, pleasurable to go and hear a piece of, con uh, a piece of music play. You're not going to tell me, surely, that you concentrate as well that you listen as acutely in a concert hall as you can sitting at home quiet or possibly with the family about, but in any case, no major disturbances. You're not going to tell me that you concentrate. If I have a score on my lap, I do, of course. Well, I, I know that you Europeans do sit there occasionally with scores. We don't here. We turn out the light. You know, we make it even more dramatic and perfumery. But um, I, I, I simply cannot feel that any good can come of this.
cultivation of, of, of the herd in, in music listening. I think what we're getting through to now because of recording is a super subjective state. You know, we, we talk a lot about this question of individuality and what it means in the listening process, whether in fact there is such a thing as a, as a listener who can form judgments that are uniquely his own. I don't think this was possible while concerts existed and while people sat there with some degree of the perspiration of 2,999 others uh, penetrating their nostrils. I think it is indeed possible now that, um, that we have home listening developed uh, to a, a remarkable degree and on the verge of many greater breakthroughs.